By the authority vested in me by the university, I am pleased to confer upon you the award of Doctor of the University honoris causa and welcome you amongst us. Congratulations. I'll put that down, ladies and gentlemen. It's now my great pleasure to ask our honoured guest to address us. Pro Chancellor, honoured guests, graduates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for inviting me here today to share in your special day. And thank you for bestowing me with this special honour. Being Lincoln born and bred, this award means a tremendous amount to me, especially having seen the university grow and blossom into the respected and successful institution it is today. As Cathy Thomas mentioned, I presented the flowers to the Queen when, when they opened the university in 1996 and I was just five years old. What she doesn't know is that I had a bit of stage fright just before I went out and my mother had to bribe me with a very large bar of chocolate. <laughs> Sadly, that wasn't an offer this morning. I think in the next couple of minutes, I'm meant to give some words of inspiration to you graduates who, having just completed your degrees, now move on to the next chapter of your lives. However, at the age of 27, and having only worked in the real world for two years, I thought it would be more interesting to share with you key moments of mine and the GB women's hockey team's journey towards winning that gold medal out in Rio. So a real key changing moment for me that I still remember vividly was when Danny Kerry, the GB women's senior head coach, rang me asking to go in trial with the senior team that were training towards London 2012. I, can, I was studying law at Bristol University at the time, and I can remember exactly where I was on the staircase in my second year house when he called. Subsequently, I was offered a full-time place on the training program. However, I had a slight dilemma on my hands, in that thanks to lottery funding, the squad were now training full-time at Bisham Abbey, and I still had one year left of my law degree to complete. Thankfully, the university allowed me to split my final year over two years and do the large majority of my studies remotely. As you can imagine, it wasn't always easy at times, but I actually rather enjoyed having my studies alongside the hockey. It gave me an escape and a balance which I think I needed when doing two things that were so intense. Now obviously Rio is a huge highlight in my career, but for me, London is equally special. I never in a million years expected to get selected for an Olympic Games, so to compete in my home country in front of packed stadiums full of British fans is something that I will never forget. And obviously winning that bronze medal was an absolute bonus, but more fundamentally, it set our team on a path of belief that we could go out there and do better. So after we won that bronze medal, the group seemed to be on the up, and we were initially doing well. However, two years out from Rio, we finished 11th out of 12th in the World Cup. And I can honestly say it was a pretty horrendous time amongst the team. A few things had been bubbling under the surface going into the tournament, and after a couple of losses, we seemed to self-combust as a team. This was not what we were about, and on returning to England, we had a serious, thorough review and debrief process to really try and get to the bottom of everything. Now, without going into too much detail, it was a very emotional and lengthy process. But if we wanted to turn things around and create a medal-winning environment and culture, then we had to have those uncomfortable conversations to really get to the root of all our problems, and most importantly, to learn from them to move forwards. So following that debrief process, we appointed a new psychologist, and again, I could talk for hours about the work that we did with her. But her principal aim was to help us develop our team culture, and as a squad, we debated our vision, values, and behaviours, culminating in something that we strongly believed in as a team, and used to create a professional but supportive training environment. And one of the sessions we did with our psychologist was, what am I like on a good day, and what am I like on a bad day? So every single member of the squad participated in this and had to stand up and explain firstly what it would look like when they were having a good day and what it was like when they were having a bad day. So for example, what they are thinking, what the signs are that others can recognise and if there are any triggers that people can be aware of. Come the Olympic Games, we would be playing in the most high pressurised environment and therefore knowing your teammates inside out, recognising when someone might be low in confidence or what their defaults are when they're tired. Those small percentages can make all the difference. Rio was going to be a real physical challenge. To put that in a bit of context, each of the 15 outfield players cover on average 9 to 10 kilometres per game at high neck speed, the same distance as an average Premier League footballer. However, there the similarity ends. 
To win the tournament, we would have to play eight games in 13 days. So our coach certainly put us through, the po through our paces in training. But going through what we did together, the horrible hockey sessions, the grueling gym routines, the trips away, the challenging meetings, all of that created a real special bond between us. And yes, the 31 of us may have been in competition for places against one another. But actually, those team connections were, were 10 times more important than any one individual star player. And that team cohesiveness was what made us compete out in Rio. Out in Rio itself, we had decided as a team to all come off social media and had created our own little bubble. Having said that, it is very hard to ignore some of the distractions of being in an athlete's village with all the top athletes in the world. My brother has always said to me, can't believe you don't get me their autographs. And I always reply, I have to play it cool, we are all there to do the same job after all. However, I must admit, I did, I did ask Usain Bolt and Andy Murray for a cheeky photograph on the first day. <laughs> Now I'm going to fast forward things. So after our seventh straight win, which was against New Zealand in the semi-final, we came together as a team on the pitch in a huddle and we looked at one another and our captain just said, one more game, one more game. And for me, this was one of the standout moments of the games because previously we would have just been happy to have made it to a final. However, it was so powerful standing there as a team with that genuine belief that we could go out there and win that gold medal in two days' time, and we were not going to settle for a silver medal without a fight. Going into that Olympic final against Holland, we knew what to expect. They were, and still are, number one in the world, and were definitely the favourites. However, however, we also knew that we were a great team, and as long as we stayed in it throughout the game, defended well, and took our chances, then we stood a chance. Now, I'm sure some of you here today were watching that final, and we were certainly under pressure. However, when that final whistle went and we were going to penalties, I just knew we were going to win. And I know that may sound very easy to say, but we had beaten them before on penalties, and when you looked over at the Dutch bench, their coach had her head in her hands and the players looked deflated. Now, I've mentioned small percentages. Well, prior to, prior to the final, our goalie had watched every bit of footage she could find of the Dutch players taking penalties and had written down their favourite routines in her little red book or on her drinks bottle. She had always said, if someone has a favourite routine or a default habit, in the pressure of an Olympic final, they're going to go back to what they know and what they feel comfortable with. And as it happens, she was right about four of the five players. However, one girl stepped up that she had never seen take one before. However, she still got her book out, pretended to read it, even though she had nothing written down about the girl, just so that she could get inside her head and pretend that she knew what she was doing. <laughs> well, the rest is history. Winning an Olympic gold medal is still a very surreal thing, and it does go to show that dreams can come true. But reflecting back now, I think about what it has taken me and the team to get to this point. Certainly an awful lot of hard work, dedication, sacrifice, and emotion. But also I look back on when things weren't going so well. And those are the moments when you learn and you fight back, be it a non-selection or a poor performance. And I'm not just talking about it from a sporting perspective, but in all other areas of your life. How you, ref how you reflect and bounce back from those setbacks can make all the difference. To all you graduates, I want to wish you the best of luck wherever life takes you next. It's inevitable there may be some bumps along the way, but getting through those and coming out stronger only makes the good times even better. Thank you very much.